Just to mention Brown Sea Island in scouting circles and your thoughts immediately go back to August 1907 when Baden Pohl set up an experimental camp to test his ideas in advance of publishing Scouting for Boys and launching the scouting movement. This week we're going to take you back to 1907 in Brown Sea Island with our special guest Nelson Block, chairman of the William Greenbar Bill Hillcourt Foundation on this edition of Artifact of the Week. In the late summer of 1899, baden Pole was the commander of the British forces defending Maeve King during the Second Boer War. Just before the 219-day siege of Maeve King began, Lord Edward Cecil, second in command of the garrison at Maeve King, started the Maeve King Cadet Corps, comprised of volunteer boys that weren't old enough to fight and were used to support the troops, carry messages, and help in the hospital. Not only did this keep these boys occupied, but it also freed up men in the understrength garrison to attend to more army duties and fighting. In 1899, baden Pohl wrote Aids to Scouting, a self-instruction book on the military scouting and self-reliant skills lessons that he had learned from Frederick Russell Burnham, the British Army Chief of Scouts, and his own personal experiences as an outdoorsman. Following the Siege of Maeve King, Aids to Scouting unexpectedly became popular with many youth, youth groups, and educators to learn about woodcraft skills, observation, and deduction. As a result of this unexpected popularity, BP rewrote the book. He removed the military aspects of his lessons and renamed it Scouting for Boys. About this time, BP began to also write and circulate his scheme for scouting, an outline of a new scouting program that would help in making the rising generation of whatever class or creed into good citizens at home or for the colonies. On August 1st, 1907, BP put his ideas to the test during a week-long camp on Brown Sea Island. BP invited boys from different social backgrounds to the camp, which was outside of the normal class-conscious English society. Eleven came from well-to-do private boarding schools of Eton and Harrow, seven came from the Boys' Brigade at Bournemouth, and three came from the brigade at Poole and Hamworthy. baden Pohl's nine-year-old nephew, Donald baden Pohl, also attended. The camp fee was dependent on means, one pound for public school boys and three shillings and a sixpence for the others. Joining me is Nelson Block, chairman of the William Greenbar Bill Hillcourt Foundation with some special items from the Brown Sea Camp that are on loan to the National Scouting Museum. Nelson, what do you have to share with us today? Today we're gonna to talk about three really fun items and they come from the first event in scouting, the Experimental Boy Scout Camp at Brown Sea Island in August 1907. One is a photograph of uh, the camp. Another is a great item, a card signed by all but two of the scouts who were there. Plus it's signed by General baden Pohl. he wasn't a lord yet. Uh, and also the world's first assistant scoutmaster, not only the first scoutmaster, but the first assistant scoutmaster, Kenneth McLaren. Major McLaren uh, and BP had been young officers together in India. Uh, they roomed together for a while. They were fast friends and they continued their friendship throughout their life. Um, and I think McLaren had already retired by 1907. So baden Pohl said, please come spend a week with me uh, in trying out our Boy Scout scheme. The third item is a copy of a uh, newspaper article written in the Burnmouth Daily Echo. Burnmouth was the town at Poole Harbor that was closest to Brown Sea Island in Poole Harbor. Uh, and it talks all about the camp that had just ended and especially the event that was held on the final full day of camp, which was a competition. This event is actually the world's first camporee. Because what it is, is it's the different patrols competing against each other. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the competition, if I may. It was a lot of fun. Uh, they did things very much like scouts today would do. Uh, there was fire building. Uh, there was a tug of war. Uh, there was a deer stalking exercise. Uh, there was one that we wouldn't do today, jujitsu. Uh, which uh, was very au courant back then. 
uh, and all sorts of people were learning jiu-jitsu. Uh, I don't think we'd be practicing martial arts and scouting today, um, but they were doing it then. And my favorite is harpooning the whale. Now, one of the reasons harpooning the whale is my favorite is not only does it sound like a fun activity that boys would like, um, and in this day and age, girls would like too, but it's like uh, a scout activity that every scouter who's watching this video has done. You do a lot of planning, and then sometimes it doesn't quite work out like you plan. So the planning that BP had to do was, number one, um, he had to figure out the game and make up the rules. Secondly, he had to hire some large rowboats to be the whale boats. Third, he had to get a blacksmith to make some small harpoons that were, uh, you know, light enough for a boy to, uh, to, to handle. Um, and then he had to have logs cut uh, to be the whales. So the boys did have a good time, but um, as we often find as scouters, sometimes programs don't work out like we plan. None of the patrols were able to harpoon a whale. So they had a great time, but I'm not sure it was really a successful uh, event. Um, at, at the uh, event, the competition, were not only the leaders and the boys, uh, but also a number of visitors. Uh, members of the Von Ralty family who owned Brown Sea Island and had given BP permission to camp there um, came to see. And also uh, people from Bournemouth uh, were invited, some local dignitaries, uh, as well as the parents of a number of the boys who were there uh, at the campsite. Very interesting. So outside of the cool factor, why is it important to have artifacts like this to help tell the story of the Boy Scouts of America? Well, I, I think it shows um, how much we're doing the same thing as we were in 1907. As I mentioned, uh, this event was not only the first Boy Scout camp out, it was also the first camporee. Um, in the picture, uh, you see tents. Um, we know that boys were there running around having a great time, um, making a mess probably, and hopefully cleaning it up, um, but doing the things that scouts do now. So I think it's great for young people today to look back and again, other than the absence of girls, um, see that, hey, what we did originally, we're still doing and that's a connection and it's a lot of fun. Now, one of the things that we know about Brown Sea Island is it was used to, uh, it was used by BP to sort of test out his scheme and his new book, the, all the things that he's writing in Scouting for Boys. What, what made that important to BP? And what was different about Scouting for Boys and the, the previous book that it was sort of loosely based on AIDS to Scouting? Um, so uh, BP was um, a, an excellent soldier and also a scout. Uh, some of that came from being an outdoorsman and as part of that also, he had learned a lot about scouting when he was in uh, India, but also in Africa. In Africa, he came under the tutelage of two very famous scouts. One was Frederick Russell Burnham, uh, who as a major was the chief of scouts during the South African uh, War, during the Boer War. Um, he was actually an American and had been a cowboy and a prospector and done all sorts of things in America. Um, so he was one of the people who taught, taught BP his scouting. The other person was a, uh, an African native um, who, because he lived in uh, South Africa where the Boers um, you know, spoke Dutch, had a Dutch name, Jan Grootboom. Uh, and he lived out on the veldt and was a guide for baden -Pol and also taught him a lot about scouting. baden -Pol took those experiences and just before the Battle of the Siege of Mafeking in 1899, had been writing a book, he was a cavalry officer, and he was writing a book to train cavalry non-commissioned officers and enlisted men in how to go about scouting, because of course one of the purposes of cavalry uh, was always to go out ahead of the other troops, try and find where the enemy was, what was their strength, what kind of munitions did they have, um, how long would it take them to get across the, the ground uh, between the, the enemy forces and your own forces, those sorts of things. Um, and so he wrote a book called Scouting for Non-Commissioned Officers, NCOs, and Men. Um, it was published right as he was under siege in Mafeking. As a matter of fact, the last mail going out of Mafeking had BP's corrections 
to the manuscript. Um, so uh, it was published in Britain um, and it was very popular because about the only thing that was going the right way for the British during the Boer War was the Siege of Mafeking, which went on for 219 days. baden Pole was the commander, and um, the, the relief of Mafeking uh, after that period was a joyous event in, uh, in Britain. The relief of Mafeking made um, baden Pole a tremendous hero. He was immediately created a major general, a two-star general, uh, by order of the Queen. Uh, and um, his face was everywhere. Uh, his um, image appeared on uh, cups and saucers, and his, you know, face was on every newspaper. Um, because of that, people started buying the book, and they realized that this would be um, an interesting way to instruct young people on being self-reliant, independent, learning to plan ahead, uh, learning to what we would think of now as being prepared, and it was used in a number of schools. Um, when BP finally got home after the Boer War and then other service that he did in South Africa, when he got home in 1904, um, he talked to a number of people uh, about the book, and one of the things they said was, it's being used by young people in school, why don't you write a separate book that's specifically addressed to young people? And he took that idea up, and in 1906 began writing what we know now as Scouting for Boys. Most of that was done in 1907. And while he was still writing, he wanted to have the experimental camp so he could try out these ideas. How exactly did the foundation come into possession of these items? Well, the Hillcourt Foundation is the brainchild of the late Green Bar Bill Hillcourt. Near the end of his career, he retired in 1964, um, he realized there was a great need for a, a serious, scholarly, well-written biography of Lord baden Pole. There had been biographies, but they weren't very good. Um, over the years, because of his connection to Lord baden Pole, he had also met Lady baden Pole. Lord baden Pole died at the beginning of World War II, but Lady baden Pole was much younger um, and uh, was alive still in the early 1960s. Uh, so Bill got in touch with her. She agreed to be a co-author with Bill. They would meet from time to time, either in Britain or the United States, and Lady baden Pole would give him or send him in the mail uh, some amazing artifacts that we now have, including those that we're showing you today, um, as well as many other original baden Pole drawings, uh, things from his diary, uh, family uh, heirlooms, uh, and letters, things like that. So when Bill passed away, um, uh, he and his wife had not had any children, his wife died first. Uh, Bill left really everything other than some gifts to some nieces and nephews to a trust set up in his will, uh, and the trust became the foundation. So the foundation now owns um, all of Bill's memorabilia, ephemera, books, writings. In 1928, there was a reunion of the original Brown Sea participants. On the program for the event, seven are listed as gone home. What is the significance of this? Well, between the 1907 camp and the 1928 reunion, of course, World War I had occurred, 1914 to 1918. Virtually every able-bodied uh, English, uh, British, you know, man served in the war, and seven of them had been either killed in action or died later from wounds received in the war. This has been a fascinating opportunity to talk to you about these artifacts, and we look forward to having the opportunity to showcase more of these in future episodes of Artifact of the Week. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all we have time for today. Join us next time as we continue to uncover the history of the Boy Scouts of America through the collection of the National Scouting Museum and Artifact of the Week.